This is episode 35 of the Indie Film Academy podcast. Today we're talking with screenwriter Chris Soth about his book, Million Dollar Screenwriting, The Mini Movie Method. So, I'll give you anything, but don't ask me to do six weeks. I can't take over the show for six weeks. I can't even take over my own life for six weeks. And you're asking me to do something that's impossible. It's impossible. Don't you understand? What? What are you doing down there so late? Welcome to the Indie Film Academy podcast, where it's all about learning how to make and market your independent film online. And now your host, Jason Buff. Hello and welcome to the Indie Film Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jason Buff. Today, we are talking with Chris Soth, the author of Million Dollar Screenwriting and the Mini Movie Method. And we're going to talk a little bit later about what the Mini Movie Method is and how you can use it to help you with your screenplays. I'm not going to go into that now, but you definitely want to stick around and learn about that. It's a, it's a way of putting your screenplay together, the structure and everything that I, I had never really heard of. And Chris, Pretty much he is the inventor of this method of putting a movie together um, into these mini movies. It's really cool. But I will get to that in a second. Also, don't forget to go to ifamasters.com and sign up for our free two-day film sales masterclass. That starts on November 17th and will go for two days. And it features all kinds of people who are experts in film distribution, marketing, um, and everything that you know to need to know to sell your film. But I've been talking about this a lot, so I'm sure that everybody already knows about that. Also, if you want a free filmmaking audiobook, go to ifafreebooks.com and sign up for Audible, and you will get free two free audio audiobooks on filmmaking or whatever you want, actually. But uh, I've on that link, you go straight to uh, Story by Robert McKee, which is a book that I highly recommend. But you've also got about a hundred different audiobooks on filmmaking, screenwriting, whatever. All right, let me get to the episode. Here is Chris Soth. Four years ago, a man named Randall Earl Shea stole $37 million and left 17 men and women buried alive. Six hours ago, he disappeared from the state penitentiary with a team of five deadly felons. At this second, somewhere in the Wyoming wilderness, the storm is about to hit. Four. Now, the best smoke jumper ever to battle a blaze. Take me down. <laughs> is about to find out there's a lot more to fight than just fire. In case you haven't noticed, we're not firemen. We saw some ground pounders running through the woods. It was a prison break. There's a girl with him. I know. She's a hostage. Kill her. Again. Let me see if you're still not a fly. Those two fires will collide and suck all the oxygen out of the air. You won't survive. You'll be in the middle of a firestorm. On January 9th, fight fire with fire. You are picking me up! Firestorm. It's not your bar! You're still alive! You know, have a different perspective, or they kind of have a specialty when it comes to teaching certain things. So what, what I wanted to focus on, um, first of all, is a little bit about your background in screenwriting and, um, you know, where, where, how you got into screenwriting from the beginning. Sure, absolutely. I, uh, well, I guess I've been sort of a nut for uh, story and structure uh, since I was a kid. I, I was an undergraduate uh, major in drama, and I started studying you know, plays and play structure there as well, though I wanted to be an actor at the time. And I just felt like you know, there was something better, and that we could, we could know more about this than we had been given by Aristotle and was kind of out there in the... Uh, uh, general knowledge pool, and uh, I did apply my trade as an actor for about 10 years, uh, also as a comedian and a magician, and 
started writing in my own material and started using some of this story structure that I had uh, studied to, uh, you know, to make that material a little better. I sort of found if I was doing a six-minute comedy set, if I told a little story or there was a story shaping the whole thing, I didn't have to be as funny. So, uh, where that made it funnier. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, I, I would do that and I started reading up on that and wrote a novel. Uh, I worked on cruise ships, actually. I uh, uh, And I was you know, doing those comedy acts there. And I had plenty of free time. So, I wrote a novel with that free time and then I wrote the screenplay of that novel, and after that, I, you know, the bug had bitten me, and I had to know everything about uh, screenwriting. Started reading all the books. At that time, there were about three of them, and uh, now, of course, there are 300. And uh, I come sort of from an academic family, and if you wanted to do something in my family, by and large, you go to school for it. My dad's a college professor. So I went back to school, uh, University of Southern California Film School, and that's where I found a far better structure method, which they call sequencing there, uh, which I, you know, use and uh, have, you know, studied and gone in depth with ever since and sort of uh, heightened and refined to the mini-movie method. And I was very lucky at USC that I wrote a screenplay there that was my thesis uh, in the graduate screenwriting program, and uh, that sold for three-quarters of a million dollars, and that became a movie called Firestorm. Uh, so, uh, you know, very fortunate to, uh, you know, have one of those big splashy spec sales on the front page of Variety and Hollywood Reporter the next day. Uh, very fortunate to get the movie made and, uh, lucky enough to, uh, apply my trade in Hollywood ever since and have, have kind of always taught as well. I mentioned I come, come from an academic background and started teaching at USC shortly after I left, taught at the UCLA Extension. And what I found was, uh, outside of USC, people were not getting this method, uh, this better way of breaking stories down. Uh, to, you know, to sort of give you the overview of the method, rather than three acts, which is taken from playwriting, um, the mini-movie method breaks a story down or a screenplay down into eight mini-movies. So if we take you know, that two-hour time frame of, uh, you know, 120 minutes, uh, we have eight 15 minute chapters, uh, uh, or eight mini movies that all add up to the story of the movie. And maybe as I say this, you're thinking, uh, of movies you've seen or you, you can remember some movies you've seen where you felt like, uh, you know, due to a certain visual cue or music cue that you've been given by the director or the filmmakers, oh, something has ended. Everything's changed now and something new is beginning. Right, so at the end of Act Two, you know, the, the cop's partner will be killed and, uh, you know, he'll look at the, you know, into the sky and holler, no, right, in the, you know, that long, long <laughs> out way, right, and the right. camera pans up into that God shot, because that's what he's talking to, God, he's saying, no, God, how dare you do this, right? Well, that's generally around the end of Act Two, or what I would call mini movie six, that is kind of said, you know, one chapter is ended and another chapter is beginning, and the music will slow, uh, too. Uh, but, you know, that, there are actually eight of those, and good stories, uh, have a structure, uh, that, um, of eight different tensions, of breaking the main tension of the story down to eight different tensions, each based on a hope and fear, uh, on which the, you know, the outcome of the main story will rely. And, uh, once you've had that breakthrough, it becomes much simpler. I mean, it's never easy to write a story, but let's say this is about eight times easier. Uh, that that really helps you out. So that kind of, uh, as you were saying, you know, people specialize in different areas. That was where I found the need and the niche where I said, well, wait a minute. You, this isn't the industry standard. Everybody should be doing this. This is so much simpler, so much easier. Um, you know, why aren't all the screenwriting books written about this method? Right. Um, I, I, I don't know how much, you know, you dabble in screenwriting or your listeners do. I know we're talking to all kinds of filmmakers here, but if you want to tell a story, this is going to help you. Um, you know, if you've ever heard, you know, Act 2, if you read your first screenwriting book and said, okay, you, you write 30 pages, that's hard enough. Uh, and, and you've got that landmark of the Act 1 term, turning point, right? And now your reward for that is you get to write 60 more without any sort of landmarks to guide you on your way. 
Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that's a nightmare. And I think everybody knows that Act 2 is where good screenplays go to die, right? You know, you, right. I mean, how many movies have a promising start and kind of falter in the second act? I, I can tell you, you know, for every movie that does that, there are a thousand screenplays that did and didn't make it to the screen, right? And, and died there in the second act. And this is the way, you know, this is, uh, a great way to kind of keep your, your second act popping, right? And really right. have attention and a build and, a, and, you know, build to a really strong climax and have, you know, little mini climaxes and mini movies along the way as each, uh, tension resolves and turns. So now, do you do you uh, chart yeah, that in some sort of way where you you know say okay, the first mini movie needs this needs to happen, the second mini movie this ne- you know do you give a general sure. guideline of the things that need to happen along the way? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, after uh, you know hundreds of years of stories and over a hundred years of movies, really thousands of years of stories and about a hundred plus years of movies, uh, we can kind of figure this out. And the method actually comes from the fact, and, and we sort of it starts to emerge. Uh, because I would argue good stories always did this, but kind of by accident. And I think that, you know, what's making them good starts to emerge, uh, when, you know, by serendipity, uh, film starts to be shot on reels and a reel hold, you know, pretty close to 15 minutes of film. And the early filmmakers, uh, as they develop what becomes the modern day feature film, you know, find it advantageous to plot out a chapter per reel. Right, so uh, I don't think you know Samuel Goldwyn was ever you know chomping a cigar saying we got a problem in Act Two. He wouldn't have known what an Act was. And I don't think Ben Hecht in the Golden Age of Hollywood was saying that either. I think he was saying we got to fix the fifth reel. Um, mm-hmm. So there's absolutely a template and a pattern uh, that you know between me and you know uh, Joseph Campbell and uh, you know a lot of other people who have studied stories and folklore. We can say mini movie one is very typically going to do this. Mini movie two is going to typically do this, and you can identify it sort of in a broad generic way, mainly because of you know where it is on the timeline, right? If if a story is if um if a if a mini movie is the beginning of the story, there are certain obligations and tasks it has to perform: introducing the main character, setting the main tension, showing this world. Things like that. There's, you can generate a checklist pretty easily. Likewise at the end, and then it's sort of, you know, filling in that, that middle where, you know, things are the most treacherous. But there's a much more, you know, detailed template than that, uh, that I gave in my book, uh, Million Dollar Screenwriting, The Mini Movie Method. Uh, that is actually available on Amazon relatively recently. You used to only be able to get from my website about 10 times the price. So, I, I advise everybody to check out on Amazon. Um, and uh, and you can identify uh, those you know kind of broadly and generically, and then you can sort of separate them by genre too. You can say, okay, well, are they uh, in a monster movie? This is kind of the thing that starts to be happening. Yeah, you know, that starts in mini movie. We see in mini movie one, and come up with different patterns as well. Likewise, in a love story, right? Uh, those those three those three famous Hollywood sentences: uh, boy meets girl, right? That tends to be the end of mini movie one boy loses girl, uh, we all kind of know that's the end of Act 2, where that heartbreak occurs, and then boy gets girl will be somewhere there in the third act, um, in the movie 7 or 8. So, you know, those are plot points they're talking about, uh, when they say right. boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl, right? Uh, right. So, so yeah, there, there is, a, is a general pattern, and it breaks down uh, by genre, and then you know, in my mentorship program, uh, that's at uh, screenplaymentor.com. Feel free to check it out. I will guide you, you know, step by step, not through just, you know, the genre of story that you're doing and not just what all stories do, but what your specific stories do. And I feel like that's, that's what we, uh, all have to master. We all have to master story in general, then the dictates the genre, and then we have to find what our own unique story is to tell and how it is best told, because that's what's going to differentiate it from all the other stories of the genre and all the other stories in the world, right? Right. Now, what I was wondering if you could do, just to give an example of the the eight mini-movies in action, um, is there a, a movie in particular that you use to demonstrate those 
eight mini movies just so that people can have an idea of of how it breaks down? Uh, yeah, I don't know that I have one absolutely by heart and by memory, but I I know uh, you know the notes I'll go to uh, when I when I'm asked this question. I and I probably could pitch you a, the, one of these two movies entirely from memory and give you all eight uh, of of the mini movies. But uh, if people are, are hearing this, uh, are saying, "Well, now that that's interesting. I'd like to see that in action. What movie can I look at?" Um, absolutely, the movie Seven. Uh, okay. when, I, when I first heard, uh, that conceit, I, you know, I was, uh, uh, in, I think I was in my second year of grad school at the time, and I, uh, I interviewed Arnold Copelson, uh, who had bought the script, and he said, uh, oh, it's about a serial killer who, uh, is killing people, uh, in, you know, in the mode of the deadly sins, right? And I, right. I, I immediately knew, oh, well, that's one deadly sin for many movies. <laughs> that's, that's right. Right. And it, it almost is. It's, it's, it's a little more sophisticated than that. But once in a while, when I idea, you know, I get an idea like that, where there's sort of a, uh, a number, you know, right in the concept that is, you know, very close to seven or eight. And, and I say, or six. And I say, well, okay, now, now my, you know, six, I say, now my story is three quarters outlined. Right? That story right. is seven, seven eighths of the way to outline. Uh, it's slightly different than that in that I can, I mean, I, I, I don't have it by memory so much that I can say, you know, mini movie three is, uh, lust, right? Um, so right. well, that's a pretty good guess, actually. Uh, and, <laughs> um, so it, it's seven, uh, really six of the mini movies of seven are dictated by, are all sort of short films leading up to a ghastly tableau. Uh, where, in which someone has been killed, uh, that is staged to look, look like, a, a, a decrying of one of the deadly sins. Um, that happens six of the, of the eight times. And it is a full, um, eight mini movie structure. Uh, they just, they knock one off right away in the three credit sequence because the first scene is Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman showing up at one of these. So, right. now, now they only have six left. Mini, the, the, that mini movie ends with another one, uh, and then when you get to mini movie four, that's all about chasing the killer. They're they're on the track of the killer there, and he shows up at the police station with his you know, uh, his uh, fingerprints cut off. Uh, Kevin Spacey and the killer they call John Doe, uh, and then he escapes them. But that's mini movie four. So uh, so two of them are are knocked off uh, by by putting two in mini movie one. And one is one is eliminated by in the movie four, and and the other six uh, each demonstrate a mini movie. So if I was uh, if I had that brilliant idea, uh, I would just say, okay, well this is the the lust mini movie, and that is the sloth mini movie, and this is the gluttony mini movie, um, and I, I would you know let the tension define that, and I would let that scene infuse uh, the pages I, I was writing. And uh, Seven is very well written and, and doesn't appear to us as episodic at all, because it's all sort of, all of those pearls are hung on the string of uh, catching one serial killer who has perpetrated all of these acts, right? And we learn a little more about him each time. So there's a great example, a very good movie and a very good screenplay uh, that sold the respect uh, using this method, and I feel like you, you had sort of a little laugh of recognition when I said that. Uh, they would sound like, oh, of course. And But we don't experience, you know, the movie that way and go, oh, well, this is just formulaic. Uh, right. We go, oh, my God, this is cool and dark and twisty, right? Uh, right. Like, likewise, a winner of uh, Best Picture and Best Screenplay, uh, I'm probably a little older than you are. I remember it from my childhood, so it's the original release. Uh, seven Oscars, swept the Oscars, uh, that year, uh, a great, uh, period con man movie called The Sting. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in The Sting, at least through the second act, um, uh, title cards come up that give a title to each mini movie. So, okay. uh, so there in that all important second act, I think it actually goes into the third act too. I no, I, I, no, I could be wrong about that. Um, so, 
that second act is chaptered very specifically with tensions that are all almost exactly uh, 15 minutes long. So uh, you'll really see it there, and you'll see it in the second act where it's so important that things don't get static, that you haven't been trying to resolve the same tension too long, that it has evolved a little bit, or the stakes have risen. Uh, that your, you know, your heroes are now trying to do something different to solve the problem. Um, the second act is where, you know, you, you know, as an audience or a reader, we can kind of look at our watch saying, look, we've kind of been static for a long time. Nothing's really changing here. Let's, let's, you know, quicken the pace guy. Um, so they're all chaptered quite, quite specifically. Uh, and it's a, a great one for you to, for you to see and study because, hey, best screenplay, best picture, right? Um, right. So I could go into more detail about that. I could pitch it to you by memory. I don't know if it's, uh, you know, our best, our best possible study here, but, um, <laughs> right. uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, go, go take a look at it yourself. You know, the, um, just quickly at the end of the day, we won the Robert Redford character once revenge against the gangster who killed his con that partner. Uh, at the end of two, he enlists the Paul Newman character to help him. Now that's what you've probably been taught to call act one in movies one and two. Uh, they're going to pull the big con on uh, on this gangster, uh, and to do that, they have, uh, I think Paul Newman says this in the first act. Uh, we got to set the hook so we can uh, tell him the tale, then we can pull the wire and fi- uh, and that'll sting him, right? And those are the four title cards. They are the hook, the tail, the wire, and the sting. Um, and they're all sort of mini cons they have to pull. Uh, uh, along the way to pull off the big con, which is ultimately the sting in which the movie takes the t- its title. So the con and, and, you know, getting the money from the mark is called the sting, and that's the tension of way up there in the seven as you break up the, you break the third act. Um, I'll, I'll make, I'll just, I just said one and two or what you've heard called the first act. Then we three, four, five, and six are what is called the second act, and Movie seven and eight are what you sort of call the third act. That's what I'm so you'll see, you know, we divide this by 15, uh, you know, 120 pages or minutes by 15. You'll see that, you know, two of my plot points are the ones you're familiar with, the end of act two and the end of act, uh, the end of act one and the end of act two. Uh, so, uh, you know, the tension of the hook is they got to hook the, the mark in to want to be in, you know, uh, in this con, which he will actually think is he's the con man. Uh, so they got to set the hook in, you know, the fish, uh, there. And our tension is, we hope they can. We fear that the whole con will be blown because it will be aligned to what's going on. So, uh, does that make sense? And, and, you know, just, uh, and I, I did this exercise with, in seven, too. And I actually recommend this to my clients and my students and anybody out here who, you know, wants to use the mini movie weapon. It's a good exercise to title each of your mini movies. You're going to title mm-hmm. your movie. Uh, you know, your movie will have a title. Why not give your mini movie a title? So I said, you know, I'd call that the, um, the pride, uh, mini movie, right? Uh, you know, the right. mini movie called pride and stuff. Now they don't have title cards come up with seven, right? Uh, mm-hmm. but they, but they do. They literally do, uh, in this thing. You know, the, the, uh, great, the great Scott Joplin, Marvin Hamler score will come up and a little title card, uh, which are the Norman Rockwellish, uh, uh, image from the coming, uh, mini movie will, uh, will come up and it will say the hook, right? All right. And it really, you know, creates in your mind as you were turning a page and came to chapter five and we have title, um, you know, it, it creates sort of a, uh, a preparation in the viewer's mind that, oh, we're coming to something new. Okay. So something has ended. Something new is beginning. Uh, now, you know, that's not going to work for every movie because of that, the, stylistic way of, of telling a story. In some movies, you know, you want to go by it so fast and not have that quaint, it's a new chapter sort of feel that we experience them seamlessly. And it's a little harder to see these plot points and these terms of tension. Uh, but they are there. They are nonetheless there. Uh, and they're you know, working to support the story very much better. Now, what is your process when you're creating a screenplay? How far do you go with um, outlining and creating somewhat of a blueprint before you actually get into the, you know, the writing phase? 
you know, it, it, it depends, and it is uh, anywhere from absolutely outlined to, you know, where writing the screenplay is an afterthought to uh, jumping in having uh, one eight sentence out one. Uh, yeah, and that, uh, you know, you notice I keep using that number eight, right? And there are eight mini movies. So uh, I wrote Firestorm, the you know the screenplay that sold for three quarters of a million dollars, it made me over a million, you know, in a long haul, uh, just with those eight sentences. And what they were was just a turning point I would jot down to end each mini movie, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, now, do I outline in more detail than that? I do, but I might do it in process. So if I, uh, so it kind of depends on, on the work situation I'm in and, and, and sort of my mood. If I can't wait to get writing, I might, you know, brainstorm those eight turning points and dive in. If I'm working with a studio or other producers or collaborator and it's a good idea that we all are on the same page, uh, and understand, you know, that what the story is going to be, I mean, there, you know, in a lot of detail. Uh, I might create a, a, a treatment that is, is quite detailed. The most I would ever create uh, without being paid for it is, a, again, an eight-page treatment. And it won't shock you to learn that's one page per mini movie, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and, uh, you know, my collaborator, who, you know, with whom I will acquaint, you know, the, uh, I'll acquaint my, anybody I like with, with the mini movie method. Uh, but when I'm working with a client, um, you know, it, it's sort of up to them. Uh, and I'll say, listen, you can bring in an outline for, you know, uh, let's, you know, let's do our brainstorm when we come up with these eight turning points of, uh, of the mini movies. And what, um, and I might say, next week blow each of those, those sentences up into a paragraph. Uh, and then maybe blow each paragraph up into a page. Uh, and then we're going to take each of those, you know, pages of prose written in treatment style, and we're going to blow those up into the 10 to 15 pages of the screenplay. That's a very typical process for me. Now, when I'm writing myself, as I said, I might just jot down the turning points, uh, all in it. So, you know, what, and it will be kind of like you just heard me do for this, do for this thing. At the end of minute one, his, his partner is killed. At the end of minute two, he gets a new partner. At the end of minute three, he has set the hook. Right? Now I'll know what that means. I'm all in scrawled on the back of an envelope somewhere. Uh, and then I might actually start writing the scripts, but I will do more outlining. It's just sort of in process. Or, well, you know, in process. Which means, you know, when I get to that mini movie that, like, wasn't really very full in my mind, I get to the, very often that's going to be five. I get to my midpoint. I'm always got, you know, which is the end of minute four, do the math, right? Uh, all the strong midpoint. Five to me is still sometimes the most amorphous, uh, movie within that second half of Act Two, uh, which is, you know, what, one of those places that screenplay is gonna die. And I, uh, uh, and I will outline the, the mini movie in more detail. And that might start with, you know, brainstorming a list of highlights, which will become a list of scenes. Uh, I might actually, if I'm really sort of up against it, I, uh, I'll sort of uh, break the mini movie down into micro movies, which means, you know, these eight steps of structure that I have are kind of the structure of everything. If you're going to work on attention in 15 minutes, uh, the steps are going to be the same. If smaller, uh, then as you, if you work them out over 120 minutes, right, and the ratio will be the same. So about, you know, one quarter of the script will be, you know, the, the beginning, and then we'll reach the end of the beginning and that quarter of the way through, et cetera. That's kind of the golden mean or ratio of storytelling or drama. So I might then outline further, but to me, those eight turning points are key. Um, the analogy I've been using recently is it, it's kind of like having a map quest for, for the journey when you mm-hmm. go on, on your screenplay. Uh, you know, your, your screenplay is going to have eight turning points, Maybe a map quest has eight turns. Well, I happen to live in San Diego County. If I'm driving up to LA, I'm probably going to go on the five. Uh, and depending on where I'm going to go in LA, I'm going to have to get off the five at some point. I kind of don't care, at least at the beginning, uh, and even on most of the drive, 
how long I'm on the five, if that's going to be, you know, 70 miles or something like that. I care about that turn, uh, mm-hmm. where, you know, my off ramp, because I know I'm going there, and I know that I can figure out the drive. That's going to be kind of a straight shot. Uh, um, so I, you know, and when, whenever we used to give directions, if you, you know, come from an age before MapQuest, it was always, you know, uh, you keep going on this road and take a right on. You know, we were very rarely mentioned how long it's going to be. We might say a long time, right? Right. Uh, you know, or then it's going to be a, a quick left. Uh, but, you know, the turns define the shape and the turns define the journey. And, right. and when I have those, I really know the shape of my story. I can fill in the details. Uh, you know, along, along the purple line of, uh, the blue line of map quests or Google Maps as I go. Now, do you have any exercises once you have your outline and everything? Do you just rely upon the writing process for creativity to come out? Do you have any tricks for kind of like making, putting yourself into a creative mode or is it just something that comes out as you're writing? Well, you know, I, I, one of my favorite quotes is from Stravinsky and it's, uh, and it is, the news will only visit when she sees you are hard at work. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, uh, working hard and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, and, and doing the work, if you expect that bolt from the blue to strike, uh, I think it will come sort of when you're in the zone or you'll cross over into the zone when you are doing the hard work. Um, but, you know, uh, the muse is fickle, and sometimes that hard work uh, does not, uh, you know, uh, cause her to descend from the heavens. And um, I, I think, you know, having a craft and having a, a series of best practices and principles that you can reliably put into place uh, is the core and the very base of what is called professional. You know the story is going to be very good or, you know, quite good uh, because you know these principles and you have an aesthetic and you know what good is. And then, you know, the muse only has to come and breathe into you a little bit to, to cross over to great, maybe. And right. and I think if you actually do study the great movies, uh, even if that writer did have that bolt from the blue uh, that that gave them that brilliant idea and they they weren't you know, assiduously practicing a craft and, you know, uh, doing the grunt work uh, that it takes to do that after they have. <laughs> you can dissect it. And by and large, a lot more than people are willing to admit in the arts, uh, dissect it and see what makes it great and and duplicate it in your own work. And that's that's why I think... Uh, movies and uh, and uh, and stories and television are getting better and better. Uh, um, partially by the sheer volume uh, that we have, uh, partially by the technology that allows us to generate more, multiple drafts faster and easier, uh, and uh, uh, and just a better understanding of what makes it good. There is, you know, working against that always the fact that you know. Once, once a great story has been told, you can't really tell it exactly that way again. You gotta come up with a worthy, you know, reinvention or let it be your inspiration for something else that is, that is also good. Uh, or you are hoping great. Uh, but, you know, as, as far as that goes, as far as, you know, the, you know, hitting the creativity and being, being in the zone, uh, I, I think of myself as a craftsman more than I do as an artist. And so, to have the mini movie method and to, and to really study this uh, is, I hate to say this, almost a way to MacGyver around not having to have uh, uh, the muse strike. I don't want to say not even not having to have creativity because these are the nuts of, and bolts of creativity that we study and the craft that we, you know, dedicate ourselves to, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So it is it is creativity. Uh, I mean, there's, and and as far as that, you know, the the brainstorming that you know that you do and 
you know, just trying to get yourself, you know, in a creative mode, I find hard work is the best thing. But if I'm not doing that and I want to, like, just get ideas, because that, you know, uh, you probably heard that, uh, uh, that dictum of, you know, uh, one, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration, right? Uh, mm-hmm. having the craft and having the aesthetic and having the, you know, the best principles and a hard work ethic, that all fits in the 99%. Uh, the 1% is that inspiration of the great idea, right? I think. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, um, and for that, I watch a lot of movies. I read a lot of books. I do a lot of reading. I try to keep myself stimulated. You know, I, uh, friends in a writing group and I have, you know, uh, very intelligent people that I try to, you know, keep in my life that really provides, you know, stimulating conversation with. And in my own, uh, uh, mentorship program, screenplaymentor.com, you know, I work with, you know, uh, dozens of clients who are great writers that I'm always having stimulating conversations with. And after you have the one big idea, right, that 1% of the process, you have to have a million other little great ideas too and so you have you know other smaller one percent you need the good idea if I do this scene uh with you know which is inspiration as well and the good idea if I do this mini movie and the good idea for this plot twist or I ideally the great idea for that plot twist that nobody's ever seen before. So you're continually challenging yourself that way and you know I, I don't know in a way uh I, I don't want to demystify it um but I, I well, I do want to do it to five, really. I feel like <laughs> that word, that word creativity, uh, you know, uh, and waiting for the muse to strike is sort of an ego trip that a lot of writers and other people in the arts take that, uh-huh. and, and they sort of mystify it, uh, so that it can be a holy and religious experience for them. And, uh, uh, and they can, you know, maybe, you know, put themselves a little above other people who don't have it. Or don't get it, right? right? And you know, I would much rather say, uh, let's demystify it. You can you can do it, and you can find great ideas with those screenplays if you just follow these steps. Um, and you know, I you know who sold the screenplay for three hundred million dollars. It's not magic. I'm not better than you. Uh, you you can learn the same things I learned, and you know, uh, and maybe not sell a screenplay for two hundred a million dollars, but write one is that is as good uh or better as one that did. Uh mm-hmm. and uh and, and I I you know far prefer that uh to sort of the uh uh oh you know uh kind of uh you know elitism that comes with uh you know creativity and uh uh, you know, what people call brilliance and inspiration. Uh, you know, God has chosen to favor me with his brilliant idea. Therefore, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I lord it all over all of you. Hey, congratulations. You, have, you know, you had a good idea. You're going to have to have about, you know, a million of those to have a screenwriting career. So get back to work. Um, now, do you feel like deals like that still exist? I mean, it seems like that's kind of like, I mean, even, even for the day, it was very, uh, kind of, you know, bizarre and kind of unique in its own way, but it's like, it seems like that kind of thing, you know, doesn't, that that world of filmmaking is kind of a bygone era at this point. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, they do still exist, but they are, you know, as you say, they were rare back then, and they are even more rare now. And this has happened, you know, I think in my lifetime, in my screenwriting career, if we, you know, want to put our fingers on why, uh, I, I would argue, you know, that it's always, uh, uh, it's not even really that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of specs got bought for a lot of money and some of them turned out badly. Um, mm. uh, you know, that's, that's part of it. But, uh, the truth is, uh, movie studios, just since I've been working, uh, in Hollywood have become more corporate. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, 20th Century Fox became part of News Corp, right? And, uh, uh, Paramount became part of, you know, uh, some, some of the Redstone gigantic media conglomerates. They, they, all of the movie students became, you know, used to be their own corporations and sell their own stock. 
uh, and, uh, and have their own shareholders. And they got bigger and bigger and, and became, you know, just a small part of some vast media conglomerate of which there are only, you know, uh, four to six now. And, uh, and it is harder to justify to your shareholders that you bought a screenplay for a million dollars and then went and lost a hundred million dollars on the movie, uh, than, uh, than it is to say, we thought it was going to work. It was by the writer of Harry Potter. Right. Or, or, you know, or whatever, uh, whatever else that, that, you know, it's been successful in another media, in, you know, uh, in a publishing company that our, that our, uh, that our media conglomerate owns. It's the best seller over here, right? So, uh, you know, it's a video game that our company also owns. It's based on a song that the music branch of our, uh, of our vast media conglomerate, which the studio is a small piece, owns. So that synergy, uh, it is, uh, you know, is kind of what, uh, has, has replaced, you know, the odd spec fail and, you know, the journeyman screenwriter who kind of wins the lottery. Um, they. So what uh, advice would you have for screenwriters uh, to, you know, how to get their screenplays read and, and how to get, you know, how to try to have a career as a screenwriter? Sure. Uh, I, I, I think that, you know, you, you want to write those big scripts spec screenplays and you want to play that lottery uh, while at the same time uh, you have other works in your portfolio that are smaller budget and will uh, go to uh, uh, to smaller uh, conglomerates uh, or you know outfits that aren't conglomerates but are still profitable so what do I mean well you know, uh, I think uh, it might be worth uh, everybody to uh, uh, take a look at a book called The Long Tail, right? So uh, it's sort of about how the market is shifting. And The Long Tail refers to, the, you know, the tail at the end of a bell curve on a graph about who's making the money in a business, right? Um, mm-hmm. So as that graph, you know, swells up high and we see you know, there's Paramount and Disney and Universal making uh, billions of dollars in, in the entertainment business. Uh, and as they have become more corporatized, uh, and, uh, and aren't, you know, a hundred million dollars used to be a blockbuster, right? And a studio kind of only wants to make a movie these days if they think the upside is three hundred billion dollars, and that's domestically. A three hundred million, pardon. Me. And, uh, as they've moved out of the movies that merely make a hundred million dollar business, uh, that has left room for us on the long tail uh, to make movies uh, and and go to entities with our screenplay that uh, that might be making movies for ten to forty million dollars that uh, that are only going to make a hundred million and mm-hmm. the opportunity there where hedge funds are stepping in and uh, other you know uh, conglomerates are stepping in with you know uh, cash liquidity where the studios have abandoned it and smaller conglomerates can move in, that's where your opportunity is. Are they a little harder to find? Yes, they are. Are you have to do a little more work, be a little better connected? You probably are. On the very far end of that same long tail uh, is, you know, uh, your friends who all want to make a movie for $10,000. Uh, and, uh, and these are the kind of scripts you can write and fund yourself. And in between are, you know, every every number of budgets from, you know, ten thousand dollars, which I sort of picked as the lowest you can make a movie for, and is probably not not the lowest for you. Uh um everything between ten thousand and uh forty million and uh and between you know, uh forty million and uh what the studios make movies for, uh you know, there there's room as well. So there are other entities stepping in, stepping in the profitable areas uh, that uh, that the, the larger studios have abandoned. Now, are you going to sell a screenplay for a million dollars to any of those entities? That will be rare at first, and I am thinking you know might come back again. Um, and but you know, could you make you know, many more millions of dollars if you are a producer on such a movie and you raise the funding 
uh, for a movie uh, and and are a profit participant uh, in a screenplay you also wrote but uh, hyphenated, you know, uh, and became a writer producer on. Uh, that's what I am attempting to do now. Uh, that's mm-hmm. where I think, you know, my next million dollars is and I hope my next tens of millions of dollars are and a higher level of creative control and fulfillment as well. So, um, and, and I'll say this, uh, I, you know, spent many years as a writer and of course had that first blush of success quite early on that was very exciting and caused me to write, you know, in that genre and at that budget range, you know, for my next 10 screens. Like, I'm now as excited by the creativity it takes to get the movie funded and made as I once was by the mere creative challenge, what is more traditionally called the creative mm-hmm. challenge of actually writing the script and deciding the events that will take place in it. Um, finding the funding for a movie uh, you know, uh, building a following, you know, as I have amongst writers and people who want to partner in filmmaking with me, uh, has been, you know, a very, uh, once I had that breakthrough to realize these could be the same thing. These are just all just challenges, uh, uh, that have, uh, that are begging creative solution. Uh, once I realize that it is the same thing, I, I can get as excited about, uh, seeking funding for a film as I can for the original idea, uh, for the film. Uh, the, you know, the former is just a little more, uh, uh, how shall I say, uh, out of my hands, uh, mm. than the other, because of course I don't have millions of dollars at my own disposal yet. Now, how do you, um, how do you feel about places like Ink Tip and the, the Blacklist? And what, uh, do you have a resource that you use, for example, if you, have a screenplay that you want to get out, or is it just a question of trying to get it in the right producer's hands? I mean, talking about strictly working as a writer. Uh, strictly working as a writer, um, I, I I recommend all of those sources. I uh, I have gotten a lot of work myself through Inktip, including a movie that was made uh, uh, that, I, that I appeared in, um, and I, I my own experience uh, with Inktip is I. I got a lot of work on it. I I don't know that I actually listed my own scripts on it because I've always had agents and managers uh, since the, since that first big spec fail uh, mm-hmm. to get script to uh, to get my scripts read. Um, I I do hear lots of great stuff of, of that as a resource. And I had a movie made that I wrote an assignment uh, from from the Inktip newsletter. Uh, you know, that was my second produced credit after Firestorm, and. Uh, and I know a lot of people who have had their, their script picked up, you know, in a traditional way. Uh, the blacklist, uh, you know, you were on, uh, on the playing field. Uh, my guess is it's going to become something very good, certainly with that brand and being sort of recognized as quality. Uh, I think, uh, it, you know, it should do well. Uh, I, I'm a little less, uh, familiar with their business model. Um, I actually know people that Inktip and speak to them regularly that haven't uh, been the case with the blacklist as yet. So, okay. uh, but I, I I recommend all of those resources. You know, always saying uh, you know caveat caveat emptor, but you know I am one of those resources myself. Uh, I'm much more about the craft of the screenwriting than I am about the marketing. But certainly, if you uh, you know write a script with me to screenplaymentor.com, I'm going to advise you on the marketing and help you craft a great query. Uh, and coach pitching as well as a guy who's, you know, sold multiple pitches myself. So, uh, I, I think these resources are a great idea. I'm, you know, I'm a piece of that. Uh, but like anything else, there, there, there are good ones and there are bad ones. And, you know, the bad one for you may be the great one for me. Uh, and so it all, I think, you know, kind, kind of depends. And I regard all these people, you know, as my colleagues and not my competition. Like we're all part of, you know, the same machine that is trying to get, you know, movies made and, uh, write and, uh, writers to own their craft and, uh, to get their work seen and, and make movies and television and novels and any other media, uh, better. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as well as being a, a writer of fiction myself, you know, I'm creating, you know, non-fiction book about, books about the craft of writing and, other non-fiction materials about the craft of writing all the time. Uh, and, you know, to make the art better, and I would even like the art of creating those books 
And, you know, uh, I would like there to be better books on screenwriting and story structure, and that's why I'm, you know, uh, contributing to those. I obviously think that there's a better method than the, it's sort of the uh, dominant paradigm out there, and that is you know, my message in that way. Okay. Well, what do you think about, uh, for example, like Save the Cat and that kind of thing? Uh, I, you know, I, uh, I knew Blake and, uh, and, and he was a colleague and we sort of emerged on, on the market at the same time and kind of from the same need, you know, which is mm-hmm. to say, you know, the three act structure is not, um, sufficient to our task. Mm-hmm. You're gonna, you're gonna fall apart in act two there. And, uh, Blake, uh, uh, um, uh, so I like Save the Cat. I mean, I, I really like anything that, that makes it easier. And, you know, I, uh, I recommend kind of everybody and all of my colleagues, as I say, to, uh, you know, to, to my students and say, you know, uh, or to anybody who asks me as a writer, I say, you know, you're gonna read all of these books, uh, eventually in a long career as a writer, just like you're gonna have to have millions of ideas. And you don't know what book is gonna give you the idea for a new movie. Or you don't know what book is going to, which book is going to solve the problem uh, that you're having with this screenplay. So when I have, I have a hot project, I'm working on the screenplay. I usually have, uh, back when we did research in books, I would always have, uh, you know, a stack of books that were my research for the project and the latest screenwriting book uh, wow. there. So I would be, you know, uh, uh, I might do my, you know, research in the morning. And then my writing in the, you know, during the day, and then uh, you know read a little bit about the craft that I've just been practicing all day, uh, you know before I go to bed that night. And you know I I could you know point to uh, uh, to most of the books I've read on screenwriting and say oh well this thing that I always do that came from that book, and uh, this thing that I always say to my students uh, or you know one of my mentorship clients. Uh, that came from that screenwriting book, and I always say it on my version of it. If I say their version, I say you should go look at uh, Robert McKee's book. Uh, Robert McKee's book, I actually, there's one thing that I can actually quote the page number off, which is the one. <laughs> uh, you know, John Truby, uh, I, I think has a lot of, you know, great and very original stuff, uh, mm-hmm. and Save the Cat as well. Um uh, some of my students, who, you know, as I say, Blake and I sort of merged at the same time, and some of my students read our books both around the same time. And I feel like I have a student who sent me a, a spreadsheet that lays Blake Snyder's structure over my. And you heard me say, of uh, you know, of the three act structure, you know, two of my plot points are the end of Act One and Act Two. If it's the same thing, I I don't say don't use the three act structure. I say use that and a bit. And likewise, I would say. You know, if you know Blake's structure, use that and mine. If you know John Truby's 22 uh, steps, uh, you know, figure out where those are going to go as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, if uh, something from the key is, is helping you out, lay that into your story as well. Uh, I sort of feel like, you know, you study all of this and you synthesize it, you know, maybe into your own method. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe you can write a book as well if, uh, and, and contribute something to the dialogue about what makes good, good screenwriting and what makes good movies. Uh, so I, I quite like, like, if there's, if there's one thing I kind of envied of him, at least for the first couple of years that I was teaching, I always sort of relied on the fact that I was a USC grad. Whenever I departed, from what I had learned at USC and said something that was just my own theory, uh, I would make a big point of saying so. Like, maybe this is crazy, but I think. And Blake just, you know, went crazy and, and gave all of his plot points wacky, wacky names, uh, that people still use them, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> um, and they became <laughs> part of the language. And it was always very flattering to me when someone says, oh yes, and then we three, particularly when it's someone I've never met, right? Right. I, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I always felt like, at least for the first couple of years, you know, if you, if you use the term mini movie method, you just had a conversation with me quite recently. Like, <laughs> or you just read my book. And now, you know, I, I will, uh, I, I'm putting myself out there a little more. I'll get emails from someone I've 
you know, picked up one of one of the folks on Amazon and say, uh, yeah, I've been using them and we met for two years and I've never met them and never never heard of them. Uh and uh and you know, and uh I've had some conversations recently with them and said, Oh yes, I always use this method and you know, they're in Australia or they're in Canada or somewhere else in the far reaching of the English speaking world and you know, and I've never heard of them and, and we have never spoken to them. And we've we never spoken to them at and they would say, No, we never have. Uh, and, you know, when you put yourself out there and, and, and start to reach that far, uh, you know, it, it's very flattering if you're like, maybe I actually am uh, changing the world a little bit for the better. <laughs> well, do, do you, um, one thing I want to talk about a little more is uh, going into the movie method, the, the mini movie method. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to that we didn't talk about was the concept of creating tension. And I wanted to get your opinion on how you create tension in each of the many movies. Okay, uh, absolutely. Um, and this is this is my absolute favorite talk. I probably should have led with this. I, I hope everyone's <laughs> uh, to the podcast. Um, you know, I actually would say, you know, you, you've uh, uh, hit upon what I think is the most important thing I teach. What I, what I get complimented on the most is, oh, this gets me through the second act like nothing else. Right now, it, now it's you know four little fifteen-page steps. I'm never more than fifteen pages away, and that's the major turning point. Uh, and that's so much better than sixty pages away, right? Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, so, what is a tension? Okay, uh, a tension is sort of defined by. And I'll, I'll, I'll even back this up a little more, and I will I will say that I believe Sigmund Freud was right in his book, The Pleasure Principle, when he said that all pleasure is a release of tension. So pleasure comes from tension reduction. If you get a massage and they're rubbing your shoulders and they're so tense, that feels good. Why? Because the tension is being relieved. Uh, if you uh, take a nap, you know, you've got some tension because you're tired and cranky, uh, that's relieving that fatigue of exhaustion. Uh, these are Freud's examples coming up here. If you, you know, go to the bathroom, that relieves the tension of a full bladder bowel. Of course, you know, the physical act of love is a build up and a build up and a build up and a release of sexual tension, right? So, if we like anything, it means it's reducing attention. Uh, if we like a story, that means it is releasing attention. So, You've heard this phrase, dramatic tension. Maybe you didn't know how important it is, right? It's the source of all pleasure we take in drama. Not the tension, but the release of it. So uh, a story is going to build and build and build and build dramatic tension and then release it in a surprising and gratifying way. So how do we build up the tension in any movie? Okay, here it is. Here's my magic formula for tension. If you ask me, this is the E equals MC squared of story. This is the equation on which all relies. Tension equals hope versus fear. In every movie, there's something we're hoping for. You probably heard heard us, uh, heard, maybe heard this called a rooting interest. We're rooting for the hero. And what does that mean? We're rooting for him to get what he wants, probably. Uh, which might just be escaping a monster that's trying to kill him, which might mean uh, uh, the heart of the fair maiden, uh, which might mean, uh, um, you know, not to be uh, sexist about it, uh, the heart of that uh, hunky man, okay? So uh, uh, whatever they want, we're generally rooting for them to get it, and we hope they will. We fear, not just that they won't, but that they will suffer great consequence in the attempt of getting it. So in Raiders of the Lost Ark, we really hope that Indiana Jones gets the Lost Ark. We really fear that he shall die in his attempt to get it. And, worse yet, that the Nazis will have it and they will become an unstoppable army. Right? So Mm -hmm. note the stakes that are attached to that hope and fear. Well, that's the, the hope and fear of the entire movie. That, that's what I would call the main attention of Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Right. Likewise, each mini-movie has attention on which that relies. 
So at the end of the movie one, when the CIA, that's the DOSS back then, comes to India and says, uh, we need your help, uh, we found this, the word staff of raw in this telegram. Indy says, uh, the headpiece on the staff of raw, you take it to the map room of, Tan- of Tanis, in Tanis at a certain time of the day, it shows you the location of the well of the soul. Well, he in that line of dialogue, just the way Paul Newman does in the sting, lays out the tension of the next three mini movies. Uh, the next mini movie is about him getting the headpiece on the staff of raw. We hope that he can, we fear, that he shall buy in the attempt, and the Nazis will get it. So uh, he gets it successfully. The one after that is all about getting into the map room undetected and finding the will of the souls. And the one after that is about getting to the will of the souls and getting the Ark, right? But if any of one of these goes wrong, we're, all, we're hoping Indy triumphs in each one. If any of them goes wrong, well, the Nazis are going to have the Ark and rule the world. So uh, hope and fear is your technique and is your surefire way to build tension in a movie, in a mini movie, I'll go I'll go further than that, in a scene or in any interchange of dialogue or beat of action within a scene. Every little beat of action or every line that somebody says uh, must move the needle on the tension meter. And it's going to swing it from hope to fear or fear to hope or hope to fonder hope, or fear to even worse fear. And if it's not doing that, then that scene, that mini-movie, or worse yet, that movie, is static. And doesn't have attention, and is going to be boring. And that is the worst crime you can commit as a storyteller or a filmmaker. Am I right? Mm Mm-hmm. To be boring. So, so do you go back and like check out a scene and say, okay, this scene is go- it's kind of like it's okay, but I want to add a little more conflict to right. it. I want to add just a little more spice. Absolutely, yes, I, I, I do that all the time. And what is that? That's rewriting and polishing. I mean, I think you know when you say you're rewriting, that may be kind of vague, but uh, this is by and large what you're doing, or at least you know in this phase of rewriting. So, of course, I'll go to a scene and say, well, okay, well, what else uh, here will, uh, will, make, will make this tension really pop? Uh, you know, this line makes me, you know, gives me a little hope. But, you know, uh, but the next line uh, is going, or, or beat, of, beat of action, is making me fear it, but how, how could it give me even more fear? What could make it look like the outcome is even worse? That as we watch a story or read a story or go through our daily lives, we are constantly trying to predict the future, right? And we're constantly trying to get evidence. Uh, uh, Michio Kaku in his book talks about this and talks about how that's an adaptive behavior, right? How, wh- why would that evolve, right? Because the people who can predict the future the best are going to survive better uh, and are going to, you know, carry their genes to the next generation, and are, you know, going to get all the food, and they're, they're going to do very well, right? So, so that adaptive behavior, uh, um, helps us out, and that's why stories delight us, because, uh, they variously fool us and get us caught into that log pattern. What's happening next? What's happening next? What's happening next? Right? So, if, if I give you an event that seems to point towards a very dire outcome, a fear, right? Uh, and then I give you another one that makes it even more convincing that that is surely going to happen. And then I spring a surprise because guess what? It happened, but it was ten times worse than you thought. And I'm exceeding your worst fears at every turn, right? Mm-hmm. So that's constantly what I'm asking myself. What would raise the stake on this? What would make this even worse? That's a very good way of putting it. Uh, or now, I assume... A, a fonder hope. Sorry, go... Or a fonder mm-hmm. hope. But... You know, the way, the way, you know, drama is structured, that golden in the drama is that, you know, three quarters of the, of the, of the drama will be, of the story will be convincing us very bad stuff is going to happen. Right. And then, right. stepping in, you know, usually with a happy ending, stepping in to save the day, uh, about three quarters of the way through, or maybe at the very last moment. Now, talking about, <clears throat> sorry, creating conflict, I, I assume that this means um, what you're saying is once you – at the very beginning, you need to establish what it is your 
um, protagonist wants. And therefore, that's going to, to be something that drives you through the entire story. Is that Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Right. And that, that's a tension as well. I mean, their desire line, you know, uh, creates that tension. Um, you know, I said, uh, we're rooting for them to get what they want, right? So there's our hope that they will get what right. they want. Our fear that they will suffer great, great, uh, uh, uh consequence in, in the attempt, right? They'll fail and be destroyed, uh, in some way by it. Uh, so, uh, and this, this applies, by the way, I mean, I'm using these broad terms that, you know, destroyed, uh, by it, uh, and, you know, I write actually ventures, so people tend to think, oh, well, this, this is only going to apply in that genre, but absolutely not. It, you know, uh, if we say their heart is broken, then it applies to a love story. If that is, if we define their destruction as that, their heart is broken, they shall never love again because, uh, the one person they could love that they would ever meet here on this entire planet has married another. Well, there's your love story. There's the stakes of, you know, a, uh, a, a many a romantic comedy. And, you know, uh, if you don't over literalize me, if you sort of, you know, hear, uh, either literally or symbolically, uh, at the end of these things I'm saying, you will realize they apply to every single story you're ever going to write. And yes, uh, you know, uh, um, I talk about this structurally, uh, and I kind of see everything as structure because that characters want is really our hope. If you want something, you hope you get it, right? Uh, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, those two, two, two verbs can be used almost interchangeably. I think if you look in the dictionary under hope, uh, you see want or desire, uh, as a synonym and vice versa, right? So, uh, they're, they're used interchangeably in so far as we talk about character. Uh, I think we should be called, uh, human wantings rather than human beings. Uh, that defines the character in a person so much. If you say, you know, you and I are talking about a, a third party friend of ours, and I say, what's he about? I think you're usually going to answer with, you know, what he's trying to do in his life and what he wants. Mm -hmm. um, so that does define character for us. And that's where character and story are so inextricably bound up at length. Now, how does that relate to creating a log line? Okay. Uh, you know, generally, uh, I think... A, a log line, and I, this is not the, the template that I specifically use, but I, and I can give you my own template for log lines as okay. sort of the, you know, the defining aspect of a, of a movie, uh, maybe not the sexiest pitch. But, uh, generally, a, you know, a log line will be one sentence, uh, the subject will be the protagonist, and it will depict what he wants. Uh, and usually have, uh, a hint of position. My own uh, uh, template for log lines, uh, you know, I, I have a, you know, a full hour uh, lecture that leads up to this phrase, of which this phrase is sort of the punchline. So I hope you're, uh, we don't have time for that, so I hope you <laughs> will stipulate uh, that, I, that I support it well and make my point. But I think the defining aspects are a hero, a villain, and a world, or a protagonist, an antagonist, and a backdrop. So, uh, if, so if we said a, um, you know, uh, an archaeologist, uh, uh, battles the Nazis to control an ancient artifact, uh, that's Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? We can get more specific, uh, but uh, so it would be, you know, uh, uh, an archaeologist uh, uh, battles the Nazis to retrieve the, the lost Ark of the Covenant, right? So that's mm -hmm. right in order. A hero, a villain, a world, right? Uh, and that's rated as a lost Ark. And the other thing I will say, and the reason I think long lines are important, is only one movie fits that description. And I think that mm -hmm. if you've got a good log line, uh, and you, uh, slap the question, what that movie where, then put your log line after it, and then put a question mark at the end, there is only one answer. So, 
what's that movie where the poor boy, uh, no, pardon me, I'll, I'll rephrase it. What's that movie where the rich girl falls in love with the poor boy on the doomed ocean liner? <laughs> As, everybody, you know, we don't even have to say Titanic. It popped right. in everybody's head the moment I said that, right? Now, I could say on the Titanic, and that would be an even bigger cheat, right? But I, I didn't because I wanted to pop that movie poster and maybe that horrible song into your head. <laughs> right, and right. and you cannot help but answer that. Now, how great a tool is that for you to have as a defining essence? Uh, to be even more heady here, the platonic form of what your story and movie is going to be. Right, that which your mm-hmm. movie is that no other movie ever has been or will be could be defined by that sentence. And I think if you get specific about your hero, specific about your antagonist, and specific about your world or backdrop. Uh, you'll get. Um, I don't know if you remember the, the movie plot generator, so uh, uh, maybe in the CS, I know the writer's store was selling it, probably look it up on Amazon. But it was, you know, a, uh, sort of three books in one because it, it had three sets of pages that you could flip. And so as you, you know, flip the top one, it changes, then there are two below it, right? Mm-hmm. So, and, and so you could change an element of a movie, you could generate movie plots with it. And they were basically laid out like that. Although, you know, I was talking about this log line template before it existed. Uh, you know, it was basically the top, the top, uh, bunch of pages were, were a hero. <clears throat> the middle were, were a villain and the third were a world or something they were attempting to do or something like that. So I think that, you know, by and large is, is the way to generate your log line. And, you know, I, I, I will make no bones about it, but, you know, for a while there, in through the 80s and 90s, a lot of people made a, made a lot of money, myself included, uh, by kind of changing the world of Die Hard, right? I flipped right. it over to Forest Fire, right? And Die Hard in a blank was a, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, a great sort of, uh, you know, we saw a lot of those movies and right. more, even more scripts sold, uh, you know, back in that day. Now, I also changed the hero, and I, I also changed the villain, right? But essentially, mm-hmm. it was a hostage situation, which is kind of, uh, you know, what what Die Hard is. Uh, maybe one of the first to, you know, to uh, dramatize that through an entire uh, movie, uh, though I think it goes back to, you know, movies called Desperate Hours in the Subway that came up in the 50s and 60s. So, you know, so... And, and the this meets that, right? Sort of tips that we hear in Hollywood. Um, always, they're always taking, you know, one of those three elements from this and another one or two of them from that. So, you know, you could also, uh, uh, pitch Die Hard, uh, uh, pitch Firestorm, you know, my, my, my spec sale, uh, you know, as Die Hard in a forest fire, right? Or you could pitch mm-hmm. as Die Hard meets Backdraft, right? So we're taking, that hostage situation, and we're putting in the world of fire, we're taking a protagonist to, you know, uh, battles fire, uh, and, uh, and sort of the hostage situation. That's really the situation. So you are going to say the world, uh, and combining it with the world of backdrop, which is fire. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, um, it, you know, I, I, uh, pitched it a couple of times. I was writing a piece of you know, cliffhanger set on fire. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so what am I saying? A lot of people running through the wilderness, these were, you know, this really just happens to be burning down around that. Um, uh, which to me, you know, up the stakes even on Cliffhanger, right? You know, Cliffhanger, which did very well, why did it set on fire? It would have done better. It would have been even more exciting. So that, that's, you know, uh, that log line for me, uh, a hero, uh, and a villain and a world. Now, you can say a hero battles a villain, and maybe the fourth element is a bird in flying conflict. So if you really want to get a more detailed template, uh, a protagonist, uh, subject to the protagonist, the verb always implies con- conflict. The direct object uh, of the sentence is the, um, is the antagonist. And then there's a prepositional phrase uh, indicating the world. So uh, to do my own movie, Firestorm, a smoke jumper, uh, goes up against escaped convicts, 
the biggest forest fire in Yellowstone National Park history, uh, is, you know, exactly those things in the order. Now, when you're going through something, you know, when you're writing that screenplay, do you go check out Die Hard and say, okay, let me get the screenplay for that and see what beats this is hitting, like what page and things like that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, okay. Uh, if, you know, certainly when I was at USC, I was lucky enough to, you know, have access to a, a, a screen, uh, screenplay library. I would go get this thing played. And I probably read for the entire first year that I was at USC a screenplay every single day. Uh, and, uh, and not, uh, and, um, and it will not surprise you at all to, to know that I go through and I create, I reverse engineer from what I would call a structural template in any movie outline, right? Mm-hmm. I will check what's happening on page 15, on page 30, on page 45, 60, 75, 90, 105, and, and, uh, what's happening you know, in the last pages. Uh, and, and what are those terms? I get the map quest structure, uh, of that story. So I'm, uh, I'll certainly, you know, read the screenplay, but, you know, I, I, I read so many screenplays, you know, that that year that I was able I would get them, you know, not just that they were a great structural template, but I would go get them if uh they just had a similar character to what I was considering, even a minor character. I just mm-hmm. those things. I would uh you know uh there have been, you know, thousands if not millions of movies. Um most of the problems have been confronted uh, and, sol- and solved to varying degrees of uh, 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 of brilliance <laughs> to, uh, you know, by somebody. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. How can you, you know, if you're very specifically creating a minor character that you know, is very similar to a well-known minor character, can you do everything that those people do down to stealing their lines or words? No, of course you can't. But they can be your inspiration, and you can isolate principles about why that worked and why that didn't with enough study. So if it was going to be similar in tone uh, to what I was like, uh, I would go, you know, go read it. And that that was another part of, sort of my, you know, uh, I only mentioned the reading part of my <laughs> my creative process. I'll watch, you know, it, at uh, you know after the, the day's work is done, I'm deep into the screenplay. I'll watch a similar movie too. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, there are certain templates I find myself uh, bringing up all the time uh, to people like, oh, you're going to, you know, you should go make a mini movie outlook of this one. And I do uh, when I can, and people write these down, so we collect these outlines from starting to archive them as a resource for uh, uh, my computer at screenplay.com. Uh, Basic Instinct, I think, is a great, uh, great for your thriller detective story, and there are some, some unique structural things it does. Uh, that have been stolen a lot and uh, continue to inspire. Um, Three Days of the Condor is, you know, great for, uh, uh, for a thriller as well on that, uh, spy intrigue. Um, and, uh, oh, you know, uh, Men in Black is sort of, uh, something I mentioned a lot to pe- for people to study, uh, for you know, their own quirky, uh, Actually, like a secret organization, uh, type movie. So, mm-hmm. you, you see, you know, lots of things have, have been done before. You're very lucky when, you know, when you have a, a really unique idea, but you're also very challenged if there mm-hmm. are, you know, if no one has gone before you down this path. So, um, and, uh, some movies sort of, you know, fail by on, on that and being sort of a oneer, as, as they used to say, a uh, one of a kind. Uh, but, uh, I, I think that you know, they're, the movies that we're seeing these days by and large, uh, fall, you know, do fall into, you know, the very gratifying, I don't even want to use the word formulas because it, it's formulaic is, uh, is a negative. I don't think of it that way. You know, a, a, the polio vaccine is a formula and it's great for us. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I need to solve a problem of not getting polio. Please give me something formulaic. So, right. you know, I, I think, uh, you know, if you make what people mean when they say it's formulaic and, and, and the implication is bad, uh, is it's not original. 
Right. Well, just make originality part of the formula, right? Uh, so I say, you know, uh, cliffhanger set on fire. Well, if it was just cliffhanger, that would be original. If, you know, combining uh, those two elements is what brings the originality. And I, I would say, uh, you know, if you read my script, you would say raising, raising the bar on action and pace uh, mm-hmm. is what made that, you know, that script worth buying and that movie worth making. Uh, you know, whatever the results may have been, but it finally was made. Uh, so I think, you know, making sure that it's a fresh take and it's original, uh, I don't know that you're necessarily going to reinvent structure. Uh, well, I, I did an interview with um, Brian Yudovich a couple of uh, weeks ago, and one of the things that he said that I think is very similar to what you're saying is um, when they make a movie, and he's, he's a producer, um, He says basically what they try to do is have 80% of the movie be familiar and then 20% be kind of new with new ideas. So people don't want to watch movies that are 100% original because they don't even know where to go with it. They want to have something that's familiar and then they want to have something that kind of surprises them within a template that's already kind of uh, familiar to them. I I, I think that's that's absolutely correct. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and there are, you know, very, you know, very original movies that are a hundred percent original. And I generally can't stand them because, you know, they've also <laughs> bought a narrative out the door. So, uh, right. I mean, you know, lots, lots of people, you know, like, uh, you know, Kleana Scotzi, which is, you know, basically, you know, Philip Glass music with, and just images from around the world. There's not a character. There's not a story to follow. Um, you know, it's, I don't even call it a movie, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, it, it's also filmed, so I guess we have to call, you know, and it's a moving picture, so we have to call it a movie, but that's not for me. Uh, and there's a very small segment of the, po- the populace who are, uh, you know, going to, uh, watch and love that. And I think they're getting a different thing from it, uh, than they're getting from, from what we call a movie. I would almost mm-hmm. argue that, uh, boyhood is, that, that, that uh, I thought was such, I actually thought it was good this year, but not for all the reasons I normally think a movie is good. I did think it was slow, which I think is, you know, the greatest crime you can commit. And yet it did add up to something and it was such a worthy project and undertaking and exploration as to, you know, a combination of movies and living life, uh, that I would have been happy if it had won the house. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, just to reward the dedication of those filmmakers and those people who, who showed up those 12 years. And it does kind of add up to something. And, you know, it, you do kind of feel like, uh, particularly as an parent <laughs> um, or a boy, uh, it has a little something to say about life uh, as, as it's being you know, lived in the early part of this millennium. Uh, by some people who grew up that way. Um, and... So, but I almost want to say, not a movie, almost its own art form. So there's an example of, you know, two things that are not really movies, that one I don't like and one I kind of get. Um, I don't know, you know, Mr. Linkletter would be upset here and say his very fine work is not a movie. Uh, But uh, (laughs) I think I read somewhere that he, he like, made a comment about hating plot. You know, and I, I thought that was interesting. That if you watch his movies, he just can't stand plot and and likes to you know have more organic kind of scenes that don't necessarily hit beats. You know, so it's just a different. You know, some people can get away with that. Uh, I, I, I so so few do. Uh, right. <laughs> and and listen, I'm I'm not going to see both of it again. I'm glad I'm glad I did. I'm glad it was done. Uh, you know, I I think it's never going to make the the money. Uh, the Transformers did, does, uh, <laughs> or you know, a, a lot of other things. So, right. Uh, well, it's you know, like that, uh, what, what was it? Tree of know, Life too is kind of like that. You know, just uh, kind Tree of, of Life. Had, like, you know, uh, to this day, this will be telling. Uh, I, I have not seen a Tree of Life to this day because uh, I just fear that I'm going to go pretty, pretty, and fall asleep. Um, I don't know. Maybe, you know, I mean, uh, uh, some people do like it. Uh, you know, as far as Malick's work goes, I love Badlands, which was pretty, you know, story driven. And I feel right. sort of defined a genre, you know, between it and Bonnie and Clyde that, you know, uh, 
um, this, you know, young couple on the run pulling heist. Yeah, uh, it's a great movie. Um, was, was defined by that. And, um, and you know, it was seminal as a certain kind of story. And there's no natural born killers without it. And, you know, certain, certain other, and no Thelma and Louise without it. Certain other stories that we've seen. Um, but, uh, I, and I understand, you know, he has a certain Zen philosophy that, uh, uh, that, you know, uh, uh, God laughs or doesn't even notice the tiny, small things that men try to do and care about. Uh, I, I get that, you know, Mr. Malik has that viewpoint. Um, and you're probably right. <laughs> you know, probably, it, it's true. Uh, it, uh, it, to me, it doesn't make for the best entertainment, uh, once, once you've, uh, I grabbed it. One of these days, I'll see Tree of Life, probably. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, it's better, uh, that's better left to a philosophical discussion for me to really grasp right. that idea and not, not demonstrated, uh, dramatically through story. Uh, and, you know, certain ideas, uh, you know, uh, have a better treatment, uh, in, in other media, I guess. So, uh, I, well, let me you know, let me change gears for a second, if I can. Um, I sure. wanted to, since we're we're coming up on um, an hour and a half, uh, <laughs> I want to wow. kind of, make sure I hit a few things. Um, sure. Now, uh, you know, a lot of people that listen to this are, you know, starting out as screenwriters and um, first time screenwriters, or people that are struggling to to you know write their first. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the biggest mistakes that you see when you have new students come in that are that are creating their first screenplay, are there any common kind of pitfalls that people run into that you see a lot? Well, you know, uh, I, I sort of feel like the you know the first step is so often the misstep, which is uh, sort of bad idea selection uh, for what you're going to you know write a movie on. And I sort of feel like there are two mistakes people make there. One is not sufficiently differentiated from other movies. They don't even really recognize that it's so similar. It, you know, it doesn't have the 20% in that 80-20 ratio that, you know, that you were talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, or your, your producer Brian, uh, was mentioning. Um, and, and I, I, I will speak to someone and I will say, well, how is that different from this well-known film. And I won't get a good enough answer. Uh, and there's this desire to cling to it because you, you know, you, you love this idea. Uh, and maybe it even got you to be a writer. And if it did that, it was worth it. Is it everything you've made? Maybe not. The other, the other is picking something that doesn't have attention to it and isn't going to be, a, you know, a good story when you're done. An idea that's just not a good idea. And having that aesthetic so, you know, having studied enough movies to know uh, what you know what a good idea is, because it's going to provide a great tension and conflict, and ideally, you know, yield a theme. Um, it, I think it's key. I think that's a, yeah, that's a very common misstep. Then we get to the actual writing, uh, you know, over directing and putting things in in the narration that uh, you know couldn't possibly be acted or dramatized or seen. You know, the, the things that, uh, development executives and are going to write, how do I know, uh, that, you know, uh, in the margins about it. So, you know, the main character thinks of a time when he was three years old and went to the old fishing hole, right? You put that in narration, you know, I, I've been an actor. I cannot put an expression on my face, even in the close up. <laughs> that, that shows you that I am thinking right. of that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and the over directing and, and really having such a strong visual in your mind for everything that goes on, but you put in a lot of things that don't matter to anything in the story. Um, Can you put in any sort of, I mean, I know that people who are writers and directors, you know, like P.T. Anderson will put camera moves and things into his shooting script. Is there, is that just completely taboo to put any sort of like camera movement or. I mean, can you do like angle on something yeah. or focus on? Uh, there, I, I think it's, beca- it's becoming less and less taboo, okay. and uh, as, as you will see more more screenplays with it. I'm I am nonetheless I'm nonetheless 
uh, and type of thing. Uh, okay. Partially because I'm just an old dinosaur and I, I grew up saying never do it. Uh, you know, <laughs> reading books that say, say, that say never do it. Uh, and, and do an over direct. My, my opinion on why you shouldn't do it is a little different than anybody else's, which is, you know, don't tell the director how to direct. He's going to cross all that stuff out. Uh, and he's going to piss off at you. My, uh, attitude is much more, at least in, in the spec script, designed to be read. That to put the word camera in it, okay, or angle, uh, is, is to jar the reader out of what you're hoped out of the flow state. They should get into such a state reading your script that they forget that they're even reading. It should flow through them. And, uh, and to put, uh, uh, and they should so they should feel like they're a fly on the wall watching uh, these people have these experiences, and then they should so forget themselves and uh, lose their their self consciousness so much that there's even for you know not even a fly anymore. There should be no wall, and that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to just achieve that zen state of of, of flow uh, with your reader, and so the, when they so they should only realize when they get to the script that they will even read it. Like, uh, a director, as Daniel calls it, the dream state. Um, and to say camera, to say angle, is to remind them they're watching, they're, they're reading the shooting script for a movie that will ultimately film, that actors are going to be playing these roles and it's to take them out of their reality. Uh, same reason I, I'm i against we see and we hear uh, in script. There's no we. Mm-hmm. There are, there is only the flow of the story. Uh, you're not, you know, forget that you are watching it and hearing it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, let it flow through. That's what I want to see in the spec script. Now, when that is changing for shooting script, I have vowed that the next one, uh, I will, uh, I'll, I'll probably get some camera directions into because it seemed perfectly obvious to me that this had to be a close up when I said, you see a tear on its face, but then it wasn't. Uh, I wouldn't say you see, I'd say, I would say tears on his face. Um, but, you know, so I go to coded stuff like that. If I describe somebody's face, it means the close up. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to get you into the visual of, of the movie I have in my head. Uh, mm-hmm. but I, I don't actually feel that we see and we hear does that. So you would just say instead of like we hear a car honk outside, you would just say a car honks outside or, or right. something like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, what, let what, me. What was uh, different? What? What? You know, wasn't that an improvement at second one? What? What, yeah. what did you did you hear a car honking when you heard that second one? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In your mind, you, what's going to be different on the screen in the movie? They're going to be the same. Right. Yeah. Now, when you were at USC, were there any screenplays that were kind of do? Well, did you have any like I hate to say this phrase, but any like aha moments when you just like kind of got it for the first time, or when you when you realized like okay, this is this is really someone who has talent, and this is a screenplay that you know is going to inspire me. Um, you know, I I read all of William Goldman's works. Uh, and it was particularly The Princess Bride. And I actually never read the novel The Princess Bride, but I, I quite liked the movie, uh, where I said, well, this, you know, this is an incredible piece of work. And it ju- you just, your eyes are just pulled down the page. Uh, Shane Black, who, you know, is sort of everybody's idol coming up in the, in the screenwriting world and had, you know, happened to him what we all want to have happened to us, uh, is on record as saying, I read all, all William Goldman, I read all of, uh, Walter Hill. And so I, mm-hmm. I took my writing style from them. And so I uh, made a point of reading all those golden scripts, and I made a point of reading all of Walter Hill scripts, and I did have one thing coming up that Shane Black did not have, which was I also had Shane Black, so I read all the scripts. <laughs> uh, right. both, both produced and, and unproduced. And, and a lot of others, as I say, you know, have the slightest element. Uh, the two that really stand out as far as reading screenplays go, that it was... I would say that the Princess Bride screenplay was so beautiful it made me cry more than seeing the movie ever has. I'm not mm-hmm. quite the cult fan of Princess Bride that everybody else would love it, just not, you know, like, 
I, I'm telling you to see it again. Um, and also <laughs> the movie uh, Field of Dreams, uh, the screenplay for Field of Dreams. Mm-hmm. I, I had seen that movie. It was very emotionally affected, uh, affecting on me, and I went and read it and had at least the same emotion, probably more. Um, so I, I guess it's, you know, I'm, I'm giving you the ones that made me cry. Um, I also read uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the ones that uh, give you this emotion, and those probably influence my writing style. I'm not exactly sure what that emotion is, uh, uh, so I'll just sort of give the reaction, which is "Whoa, cool!" Mm-hmm. I read a lot of those, um, and uh, in fact, my my producer said that you, you're going to carve yourself a niche in Hollywood as the cool stuff guy. Um, <laughs> And that, that is what I tried to do, and that, that's kind of what I, I learned to write quickly. Um, now, I've, I've written, I have written screenplays since that don't make you cry. It's a bunch of comedies and a, uh, a family movie and, and things like that. And that, that came a little later, but my ahas, uh, and the ones that really stick with me are, you know, what I can remember being on their exercise, exercise bike reading, tears streaming down my face. Uh, or uh, Field of Dreams, The Princess Bride. All right, now my final question is always the same. I call it the time machine. Okay. If you could go back in time and talk to yourself when you were, let's say, 18, 20 years old, what advice would you have for yourself about filmmaking or screenwriting? Mm-hmm. Or life in okay. general. <laughs> no, whatever. Wow. Okay. Uh, filmmaking and screenwriting, I think I would say – uh, start writing now. Because I came to writing late. And I'm always very jealous of the people who, who are that age and know they want to be writers. Because I went through two careers before I really started writing. And then I would say, because it is all writing. Uh, all filmmaking is writing or all of writing and filmmaking and art in general are the same thing. Some other thing. And as best as I can determine, there's a relatively recent revelation for me. I certainly didn't know what I was thinking. Is they are leveraging the most meaning that you can into the smallest possible piece of information. So, into uh, the most meaning you can into into a visual, the most meaning you can into a word or words. If you have a line that is five words long and quite meaningful, if you can uh, cut one word and lose no meaning, you just increase the ratio of word to meaning, of syllable to meaning, by 20%. And so... Uh, fill everything with meaning if I only had uh, four words to say that 18-year-old. I would say that about about writing. I would say that about filmmaking. I would say that about art. And since you asked, yes, I would say that about life. Well, Chris, I, I really, really appreciate you coming on today. And uh, thanks for for spending the time with us. Uh, Jason, it, it's been a real treat. Please uh, send me a link and let me know when it's up. And all that. All right. Uh, just so so people know, can you um, do you want to put your links up and and your how to get in touch with you and find your books and things? Sure, absolutely. Uh, if you search my name, Chris Soap, in the Kindle store, uh, you'd see I think at that at this point five books there, and I intend to kind of be publishing it like a Kindle single size book uh, several times a year, maybe as, as much as once a week. Uh, shortly, I do sort of a regular screenplay mastermind group, and I sort of started to transcribe those and publish them because people said to me, I, I want that information, please get that to me. So you can find that Amazon. I have, um, I guess my flagship website, uh, now is screenplaymentor.com, and, uh, there's another one, million dollars screenwriting.com. And if you want to reach me personally, uh, that first name and last name, Chris So, C H R I S. S O T H at AOL dot com or Gmail dot com. You can get to me either way. Chris at AOL, Chris at Gmail.
All right, Chris, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. It's been fun. All right, that's going to do it for today. I want to thank my guest, Chris Soth, for coming on and talking to us about screenwriting. Um, we're going to be covering a lot of screenwriters this week. Uh, I still am working on my Roger Corman episode, um, so I'll have that as soon as I possibly can. But this week, I'm going to focus completely on screenwriting. A lot of people have been writing me and telling me they really like the Corey Mandel, Alex Dean Laris, and I have a lot of great interviews that I haven't released yet from really amazing people just like Chris who uh, can help you with your writing and give you a lot of great insight. So we're going to continue this week with that. Um, so I will hopefully have another episode either tomorrow 